have, uh, uh, we have been covering, uh, looking at the Lord's Supper in the liturgy. Last week we did, take my jacket off, get serious here. Um, last week we did the preface and the proper preface and kind of talked about how, how this uh, ancient language uh, was used, how it's steeped in the scriptures, how this is some of the earliest liturgy that we, uh, that we've that we have uh, comes from that period, um, and this is another one that has a very, uh, a very, very interesting history behind it. Um, let's look at the text. This, that one that I was just putting up there, was the, uh, uh, was the version from Divine Service Two that we're doing right now. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. As we'll see, this is kind of a, um, kind of a, I don't know, a, a, a wedding of two, uh, of two texts from Isaiah chapter 6, which we'll look at in from Psalm 118, and it has a very long history, but before we get to that, I want to look at these words a little bit closer, since we had so much fun looking at, uh, looking at the, at the Latin, I thought that we would do that again for just a moment. <coughs> Sanctus, 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 Dominus Deus, Sabaot. And I remember, and uh, when we do Divine Service 3, thank you very much, we get that word, which sounds, or looks at least a little bit like uh, Sabbath, right? But it's not. It's a completely unrelated word to Sabbath. Sabaot is the is the, the Latin, or it's actually a Hebrew word that, that it goes into Latin that means um, armies, basically. Yep, so, so a literal translation would be holy, holy, holy Lord God of, of, of hosts, or, and hosts are the, the heavenly armies, that's kind of the, that's kind of the depiction, all of, all of heaven. Um, and that is why, by the way, the translation in, um, uh, in Divine Service 1 and 2 is, is just frankly wussy. I think that's the theological term. Um, in, uh, in that one, it is Lord God of power and might, which is true, but that's not actually what the, it's just a very, I, I think a very weak kind of version of that. So, Sanctus, 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 Holy, 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 Lord God of, of hosts, Lord God of the, of the heavenly armies, the heavenly hosts, the angels, that's what that's talking about. Full are heaven and earth, glory yours. So, full of heaven and earth are your, are your glory. So that part we... Uh, that part we kind of get, and, and when you see that word glory, or gloria, by, by now, after the last couple of years, that should evoke all kinds of Old Testament pictures in your head. That's this, this glory of God, that God's heavenly presence coming down on the tabernacle, this cloud, and we'll, we'll see in Isaiah kind of where that picture comes from a little bit. Um, but heaven and earth are full of your glory. So, so there is this kind of, heaven and earth are one in that, in this event that is happening. And we got that a little bit in that preface that we talked about last week. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. So, heaven, angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven, and earth are full of your glory. And what else does this sound like a little bit? Does this sound like any other song or, or canticle or thing that we say or sing in the liturgy? Like when you're closing your eyes and you pray. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. So this actually kind of points back to the Gloria, which we sang a little bit before. As well, so there's this tie to the song of the angels at Jesus' birth and the song of the angels at Jesus' death, if you will. 
and at the resurrection. So, so we get, holy, 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 Lord God of hosts from Isaiah 6, heaven and earth are full of your glory, which is um, Isaiah 6 and Psalm, Psalm 118, and then Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. What does Hosanna mean? Yeah, save us now, literally. Yeah, save us now. So save us now, and, and it's kind of a weird phrase if you think about it. Save us now in the highest? What does that mean? Save us now in the highest. Save us now um, by bringing us to heaven. I think that's the best read of it that I've been able to in my study and find. How does God save us? And remember, save is rescue talk, right? So God rescues us from sin, death, and the power of the devil to himself in heaven. So there's that kind of where we rescue from, and where does he bring us to, kind of along the way. So that's, and so it's actually a very short text. It's not, it's not very long, um, but, uh, but it is packed with lots of stuff in there. And you can also get lots of, I'll say lots of overtones about the Lord's suffering in it too, which we will see a little more. Any questions before we... Before we look at these, look at these scripture passages a little bit. I think that's what I have next. All right. <coughs> Isaiah six, verses one to six. This is um, Isaiah the prophet, and this is a vision that Isaiah has. Um, it's called the Call of Isaiah. Okay, so this is Isaiah chapter six. So this is. Not long before we get the, what's probably, I don't know, not most famous, but probably the most famous verse in Isaiah, Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Amen. So this is kind of right before that. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. <coughs> and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. All right. So the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah has this, this vision of, of, uh, of Yahweh, of the Lord sitting upon a throne, um, a vision of, of heaven. And there are a number of things that we get in this, um, this uh, robe that fills the temple. This is one of the few places in the Bible where we get kind of reference to uh uh, to that uh, heavenly temple, kind of that, that picture, um, and how does that relate to the earthly temple, etc. Um, above him stood the seraphim. What are seraphim? Apparently angels. Apparently angels with six wings, exactly. Um, and that's what this is a, is a depiction of. It's a, is a, is a six-winged angel. Um, and, and one of the things that, uh, that I have been kind of musing on doing when we're done with the Lord's Supper is doing a Bible class on, uh, on angels. Angels are kind of always a, uh, are, are a perennial topic on TV and kind of everywhere. Um, I've done that a couple times before, but I haven't done it here. So you can kind of tuck that away. For our, uh, for our future reference, but there are 
different, excuse me, different ranks of angels in the in the Bible. The the highest rank of angel is called an archangel, which means chief angel. Um, and uh, and in, um, and so we we hear of two archangels in the Bible, Gabriel and Michael. Um, and then and then above and then. Directly in the, the archangels are the seraphim. <coughs> so that's kind of a part of these ranks of angels. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. I got a whole study for it. I'm just going to have to come back. Thank you. Um, so above him stood the seraphim. So where God is, there are his, his messengers. Remember, angels are angels are messengers. Angels are uh, the hosts are, are depicted in the Bible as both messengers and warriors. That's kind of the, the picture that you get in the scripture of, uh, of angels. I'm not aware of any pictures in the Bible of, uh, of angels with, you know, kind of with little diapers and their bottom hanging out and, you know, kind of cute, cluttery things. They're, they're, always, they're always depicted closer to the seraphim thing, or as a man, like the, you know, the three angels coming to, uh, to Abraham and such. He said, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but I had to peek in there for a second. Gloria. Well, I'm thinking about the New Testament, so we get the the beginning of the Gospels, and then not again until the Well, they're in the, they're in the beginning of the Gospel, uh, they appear at Jesus' passion. Remember, they ministered well, and at, and at his temp so firm, at his temptation, at the passion. We get reference to them at the pool of Bethesda, um, but then at his passion and, and death, and then at the resurrection, and then the next reference uh, to the angels is at the ascension, and then um, and then you also have the angel. Um, delivering Peter out of the jail in Acts, so there, so there actually are quite a lot of references to him in there, um, and then, and then finishing up in, in the Book of Revelation. All right, so, so this uh, this six winged angel uh, attends God, and one called to another and said, uh, "Holy, holy, holy, is the Lord of." Sabaoth. And we actually still sing that in uh, Divine Service 3. Oh, 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 holy, oh, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are over of thy glory, etc. So we get that in uh, Divine Service 3, that, that word Sabaoth. And every once in a while you'll find a word that just it just doesn't seem like it works in English. That no translation can quite capture the whole thing. Gloria is one of them that we that we often don't translate. Um, but Sabaoth there, and we've kind of made a few attempts at it. I don't think host really does it justice either. Um, what's it? Can you think of any other kind of Bible words that? That we that we say or sing that are sort of that aren't really English words that we do a lot of. Amen. Amen. Yep. <laughs> that's that's good. That's Hebrew. Yep. And our uh, confirmation students would tell you that means yay yay it shall be so. <laughs> yes yes it's true. Um, Alleluia is another one. Hosanna. <laughs> is another one. I mean, and, and time and time again, in the, we get these words that it's like they're it's like they're so big and so packed and so important that you don't want to mess them up by by making them less. Sometimes it's easier to leave it untranslated so that it has to be taught rather than. You know, it, you wouldn't think that there was anything special about the Lord God of power and might. I mean, what does that mean? That means God's really strong? Is that the most that that has? No, oh, there's a whole lot more to it there. So, so they sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Why three? Yeah, Trinity, 
Yeah, that, that's definitely Trinitarian language. Um, that's also in uh, this weird Hebrewism in Hebrew. They don't have holy, holier, and holiest. <laughs> um, if you're gonna if you're gonna make something the most holy, you have to you have to repeat it. So so that's why you get you know, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, that sort of that sort. Of, you wouldn't say that King is King or or the Lordy is Lord or something like that. And and this is actually um, a little bit odd that there are three. Usually it's the uh, King of Kings, not not three. So this is kind of like a quote a movie, this one goes to 11. <laughs> this, one, this one goes that much farther. Yes? Is there also a numerological significance? Well, sure. Three is a, three is a number of completeness. It's the this, it's this Trinitarian number. There's, so there's all kinds of stuff packed into this, uh, this threefold holy here. Holy, holy, holy is the, is the Lord of hosts. And so they're confessing this in God's presence while they are above him. So they're kind of surrounding him. This is also, by the way, why a lot of times in church, in church architecture, you will find on the wings of the, of the altar or around the altar or like in, in banners or paintings or statues or something, you will find angels depicted in... Uh, in the front somewhere. That's this picture right here, is where God is, there all of heaven is, is with him. And that includes the and that includes the angels. So that's kind of why we have this this uh, image or picture of heaven. Does that make sense? Is everybody kind of kind of kind of with me here? Alright. And the foundations of the threshold shook with the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And this is not smoke. That's a terrible translation. It's not smoke like it's like it's on fire and they need to call the heavenly firemen to come and put out the fire. Yeah, it's incense. Is that prayers? Yeah, exactly. That's that's the uh, this is this is incense. This is the smell of heaven. This um, this sweet smell that that is offering that is made in praise to God that recognizes who God is and what he has done for us in his son. So that's kind of the picture that you get there. Now, what's Isaiah's response to this, to this amazing picture? I am toast. <laughs> that's the picture. Woe is me, for I am undone. I've always wanted to have a great time to say that. I mean, this, this is sort of one of those lines you feel like you should say something. Woe is me, for I am undone. But, um, yeah, oy vey, exactly. Oy vey. <laughs> or uh, if we were German, we would say, ach, du lieber, <laughs> or something like that. So, so he is, why is, why is he, uh, why is he woeful? Because he's in the presence of God, and he recognizes God is holy, and I am not. And I am not worthy to be in God's presence. And then you get this amazing picture of, of absolution. This, this angel taking this coal uh, from the altar and, and placing it upon his lips and cleansing him. That doesn't sound like a cleansing process to me. It sounds rather painful, but nevertheless, we'll, we'll stick with it. Um, and this, too, harkens to take, eat, take, drink. This is my body. This is my blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. That this is that this is put on your lips and your sins are therefore forgiven and that is how you are able to enter into God's presence is because you are cleansed because you have been made holy um, this is a, I, I, I guess you call it derived holiness or something something like that I am made holy in God's presence by, by 
is the word of forgiveness. This is also, by the way, why we often, not kind of absolutely always and in every and in every single time, no matter what, but we almost always have a formal confession and absolution at the beginning of the service. This is the same concept, is that the, is that the word is what makes us worthy of being God's presence. And there are actually several of those that happen in, in the liturgy uh, along the way. Is, you know, the formal absolution, but also the Lord be with you is really an absolution. Peace be with you is an absolution. The sermon is an absolution. The gospel is an absolution. I mean, so, there, so there's a lot of forgiveness, all forgiveness all the time. <laughs> that's kind of, the, that's kind of the, the running theme through the liturgy there. So, so that's Isaiah 6. And we can see this, this first part, um, and, and while this translation doesn't have heaven and earth, the heaven and is added later. But you get in this translate in this translation kind of the sense of everywhere. <laughs> that's that's very much the picture. That everything is full of, of your glory. Does anyone have any questions? At this, at the, it's a great picture. It really is. And uh, I didn't, I didn't put it up here, but we may need to, uh, we may need to take a look at uh, Luther's, uh, Luther's hymn, hymn version of this, which is a hymn called Isaiah Mighty Seer, um, which is a, just a fantastic hymn. Not, not an easy hymn to sing, but a fantastic hymn. We, we did it on Reformation with the, with the choir. Um, really a great great version, and, and he really kind of follows this text very closely with like that. Alright, if there are no other questions or comments, Psalm 118. Um, and I just, and we could look at the whole psalm, but I just pulled uh, a couple, uh, kind of the, I'll say, the money versions <laughs> for our purposes out of, out of this psalm. Um, Save us, we pray, O Lord, which would literally be translated Hosanna. <laughs> Save us, we pray, O Lord. <sighs> o Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Now, there is a lot in there, too. First, we have this there is a plea or a cry for God to do something. You know, that's, uh, that is one of the chief components of prayer, right? This prayer is, is, is petition. It's, ask, it's not only asking, but it is certainly asking God for something. And so this is saying, save us, Lord. We're in trouble here. Do something. <laughs> that's, kind of the, that's kind of the picture. We're in trouble. We can't, we can't hosan ourselves. <laughs> we, we have to hosan up. We need you to save us. So save us, Lord, we pray. Give us, give us success. And then we get this other line that, that we know from the New Testament. I think. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now where do you hear that? Where do you know that from? On Sunday, exactly. That's the people. That's the people singing this song of of ascent. This song that was sung and in entering into the temple. And who are they singing it to? Jesus. And what's he doing? He's coming into the. He's coming into town. He is entering into his city, his place, going finally to his temple. And, um, and so, blessed, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And where God's name is, there God is. We get that. We get that from the second commandment. You know, God, God puts his name, and, and, that's, and that's the language we get in the Old Testament. God, I cause my name to dwell among you. Now that's the kavod, is God's name comes down and dwells in him. Where God's name is, that's where he is. And so his name is sacred, holy. 
And so to, to be in the presence of the name of God is to be in the presence of God himself. And so blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the presence of God. And, and of course, this also has, has for us kind of um, baptism imagery too. Right? I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. How is it that I am that I am able to come into the presence of God? It's because God has put his name upon me in my baptism. So now um, I am not, not simply Todd Peppercorn, poor miserable sinner. It's still true, but I am not simply that. I am Todd Peppercorn, Christian, <laughs> baptized. That, and that is how I am worthy to be in God's presence. And that is what Jesus brings, is God's presence, his name, into, into God's house and God's people. So, so this Sanctus hymn is the wedding of, of that Holy, holy, holy Lord God of the heavenly, of the heavenly hosts, of the heavenly armies. Um, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Save us, we pray, O Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now so wed those two together, and you get what we call the Psalmatrix. Is everybody here? Everybody with me? I think that's quite a, a, it's really a remarkable picture. And this is why in many respects, musically, in terms of the liturgy, kind of the two high points musically in the liturgy are the Gloria and the Song. <coughs> those are, the, those are the, the, the two confessions of God's presence in our midst by His Word. Those, those two kind of go together. And really, Confess or say a lot of the same things. Okay. So just to take a moment and look at this is uh, this is Jesus' uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem. What we think of as Palm as the Palm Sunday uh, Palm Sunday read. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I wanted to. Uh, uh, I'm going to start reading it verse six, which is about uh, halfway down there, if you can see the rest. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, put on them their cloaks, and he sat upon them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road. Others cut branches from the trees, spread them on the road. The crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? The crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. So we can see in that, in that vocation what, what is really a, uh, a, a, a translation of that Psalm 118 verse. Um, with, the, with the adding of Hosanna to the son of David. And remember what that means. Save us now, son of David. That is not simply a, oh Lord, you're so awesome kind of, kind of phrase. That is actually, ask, that is praying and asking that God would do something. Hosanna is save us now. Do something about our problems. Okay? Whenever you hear that word Hosanna, uh, I want you to have that in your head. You're asking God to intervene in your life and to do something for you because you need help. As do we all. Okay? Ben. Why is this an Great question. This is the this is the only text or this episode this is the only episode that appeared twice in the lectionary every single year. Um, this is the first Sunday in Advent, and this is the and this is Palm Sunday. 
And if you were to look at Advent hymns, we're not, we're not far from Advent, so you may, you may still have part the glad sound ringing in your ears or something along those lines. I, I, I went through and counted, I think like a third of our Advent hymns reference Palm Sunday. A huge number of Advent hymns have reference to palm branches, hosannas, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It is a very, very common, and the, and the reason, best as I've been able to discern, is that Advent is about the, uh, is about the coming of God in the flesh of his son, by word and meal, and at the last day. And that this is Jesus entering into his city. So this kind of sets the stage for how does God come to his people? Kind of asking that question. And so this, this really sets, sets up for us what then happens during Holy Week. Good question. Any other <coughs> questions, random or otherwise? Yeah, but when they were crying Hosanna, uh, Hosanna to the Son of David, save us now, were they thinking of the spiritual salvation that Jesus was about to offer, or were they thinking of the birth of Jesus? Um, that's a great question. I think the answer to that is probably yes. <laughs> um, that, and, and we certainly see that in the in the crowds in the gospels. That that the crowds are um, are schizophrenic in terms of their desire. I mean, this is the same phrase that you know, blind Bartimaeus will pray on the road, Hosanna to the Son of David, help me, I am blind. Um, and here, it certainly. Well, I'll put it this way. In my reading of this Palm Sunday text in the Gospels, there isn't any indication of the, we're so glad you're here because you're going to go stomp the Romans. I mean, that's not actually in the text. I mean, we definitely get that elsewhere. But uh, people are fickle. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> and, and we aren't consistent. And, I mean, so in the Gospels, as you read the text, it certainly reads like they get it. But then, of course, a few days later, you know, the same people are crying, crucify, crucify. So, I don't, but that's, that's the best I can give you. It's bad. And then, if, if you look at the political aspects of the promises of the Old Testament about the Son of David, I mean, all those promises are still there, they're still in force, right. they're still coming when Christ returns. Right. It's just they didn't happen at that point. They didn't happen at that point. They didn't happen in, in the sense that every kingdom will come to an end. <laughs> right. Um, and the government right. will be on its Will be on his shoulders. That's our his care his care and rule will be, you know, that absolutely. Absolutely. Um so I, can see so I, I would say if sense. I could if I could put it, I, I guess I would say that the people uh, the people's understanding of the Messiah. It's not that they were thinking too big, they were thinking too small. That he does not only come to uh, to save them from physical oppression, but also from sin, death, and the power of the devil, and that it is all there at one point. Ada? I think we have a clue in that the choice of the Roman and the cold um, yeah, oh, right, and how God does this, absolutely. Yes, because if he would have chosen a horse, it would have been a war. Right, they this is not a war horse. Into yeah. war, but since he chose the donkey, it would mean something different. Yeah, right, yeah, right there, that quote from Zechariah 9. Humble, mounted on a donkey, and a colt, full of a beast of birth. So, So his rule is not like, the Romans. This is not second verse, same as the first sort of thing. That his rule will be different than that. So, so just to kind of bring us bring us back to the song to what this, their use of this song confesses Jesus' presence in their midst. 
okay, and their confession that Jesus is the son of David and the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That's who Jesus is. He is the son of David. He is the son of God. He is now here among us. Okay? The last reference is from Revelation. And this is not an exact quote, but it, it is at the very least an illusion. Not an illusion, like David Copperfield. An illusion. Um, so this is a part of St. John's vision of the, of the throne. Same throne, by the way, that we had in Isaiah 6. Revelation 4. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion... The second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. Those four are, uh, are later adopted as the four symbols of the evangelists. So, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, which sounds seraphimish, with six wings are full of eyes all around. And within a day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So again, that's not a, an exact quote from Isaiah 6, but it is, but you can definitely see it from there. Okay? We read it. That's no problem. Pardon? We read Isaiah 6. is exactly what I thought about. Yep. Yep. So we get this, we get this threefold, holy, holy, holy. We get this image in Isaiah six of God entering, uh, God being present, and that and that His name brings His presence, and His presence brings forgiveness. We get that same image in Palm Sunday. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord, and we get this image as the as the image of this is kind of the heavenly conversation. This is what the angels are, are singing about and talking about, is, is God's, God's eternal mercy for his people. Okay, Chris. What's with the eyes? You know, and this is one of these things where uh, when artists try to depict it, it kind of gets weird. Um, and I, and, and I, have, I should have brought, brought some, but... Uh, uh, but uh, you will occasionally find an artwork that will depict the seraphim as having many eyes. Um, and I'm, it, certainly symbolically, this is the, you know, God's presence, you know, he sees, sees all things. I mean, that's, that's essentially what, it, what the picture is. Ben? Um, how much of this is just pure symbolism? Like when you see Jesus with seven horns and seven eyes. Right. All powerful, all <laughs> But you don't necessarily think he's got seven points. Well, that is not a uh, that is not a rabbit hole. That's more like a gaping crater <laughs> um, of, uh, of of reading reading the Book of Revelation. Um, my thirty second answer to that would be what what Revelation pictures is. Uh, is the people of God at work and heaven and earth as one. And that we get lots and lots of, of this symbolic language and symbolic image, imagery that points to all, of, all kinds of other things in the scriptures. And the difficulty in interpreting the book of Revelation is, uh, is we tend to make we tend to make the literal things symbolic and the symbolic things literal. And the and the real uh, the real trick is to figure out which is which and why. So that it's not just me making it up out of my head. Um, and some sometime uh, you can you can try to talk me into doing a Bible class on Revelation. Good luck. <laughs> That's a tough one. I'm not saying no. So, so 
that's kind of the, the scripture background to the song juice. And this is just a little bit more, a little bit more history for us. Um, the song juice was was prayed and used both in the temple and in synagogue liturgies. So this is not actually a, a Christian a kind of a Christian use that the Sanctus predates um, our Lord. And this is a part of the, this, so this is a part of Jewish liturgy, um, probably for hundreds of years by the time Jesus comes into the, uh, comes, comes in his flesh. So this is not a uh, uniquely Christian uh, piece either, which I find very, very interesting. But it is one that was uh, continued and adopted by the, by the Christian church from very early. Uh, first, first mention of it explicitly um, is 3rd century, so 200s, so maybe 150, 180 years after Jesus. Um, there is uh, at least one, uh, one early church, Father Clement of Rome, that, that makes an allusion to it that's closer to around 100 AD. Um, but again, Remember, there are no books. They don't have a, you know, they don't have a liturgy committee that's kind of constantly tweaking things and changing and changing things every other week. Um, they are they're using what is familiar and known by all, and so uh, liturgical change in the early church was way, way, way slower than anything that we could we can fathom. Uh, with the printing press. Um, and again, this predates Christianity probably for hundreds of years, even. <coughs> but, it is, but it's explicitly referenced um, pretty early on. And uh, we start to see um, liturgies written, kind of the whole thing start to finish written out, or, or uh, like the liturgy of the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, start to get written out in the 300s. And so we get a we get a reference to it there in uh, in 360. And what those what those authors are doing is I'm going to make up a liturgy. It's, it's not that, but are rather saying I'm going to record how this is actually done at this place. Um, and so the practices that that kind of informs are much much older along the way. Um, and by the fourth century, it's universal. Um, and, and has really been in pretty much every traditional, it's not pretty much, it's been in every traditional uh, Christian liturgy since the 300s, for sure. So it would be bizarre to have a communion liturgy without the songs. I think that's, I think that's probably the little term. Um, because of all of that biblical biblical imagery, the, the tie to Old Testament worship, it's 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 use and especially it's confession of of who of who Christ is and that and in many respects the the Sanctus confesses the real presence of Jesus in the Lord's Supper as well. That he is not not just here generally, but that he is here now with us in this place at this meal. So, just to sum up, and then I'll uh, I'll let you guys shoot me down if you want. Um, some of this is more obvious than others. God is God is holy. He is set apart. He is not. Um, he is not. He is not like us, and yet he is. <laughs> he is the Lord of the heavenly army. There's that Sabaio word that we talked about, um, and we get a here and now. That's that Hosanna. Save me now. That's what that word means. How does God save me? <laughs> he saves me in the sacrament. That's how God, that's 
not the only way, don't mishear me here, but that is definitely what the song post is talking about, because that is, that is the context in which it is sung. Does that make sense? I think, I think that's a pretty, it's a pretty powerful picture there. And, and when we're talking about this, it's also important to sort of recognize, don't, don't pit God's sacraments against each other. Don't pit God's word against the Lord's Supper. As if, as if they're in competition with one another. As if they're not. <laughs> um, this is uh, what I'm talking about is what the what the Lord's Supper is and how it's confessed. Um, so we're saying that something is actually happening here. This is always a remarkable thing when you think about the liturgy, is that it is very easy, I think, to get this picture in our head that what happens. What happens when I go to church is that I sort of enter into a time warp where I go and I'm trying to remember all of this stuff that happened 2,000 years ago. And I can forget that God is doing something for me right here, right now. Take and eat for the forgiveness of sin. Right here, right now. It doesn't say, take and eat and remember that I forgave your sins 2,000 years ago, which is also true, by the way, but it says, for the forgiveness of sins, right here, right now. You know, in our absolution. They don't say, I remind you that Jesus forgave all of your sins 2,000 years ago. I could, and that's true, but that's not actually what we say. <laughs> what is it that we say? I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because God is at work right here, right now, doing something. That this is not a um, that this is not a memory game that we're playing. This is not a movie we're watching. But that God is actually active and present with His people, delivering His gifts here and now. I don't know about you, but I think that that's a pretty big deal when we talk about worship and what's going on. And that's to be in the name of the Lord is to be blessed. And so again and again and again in the Psalms, but we get this repeatedly in our, in our liturgy. God's name is put on. It's just the very first words out of, um, out of my mouth as a pastor. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You know, that's God's name put upon us. You remember my, uh, my continual... Uh, my liturgical dilemma at that point. You remember that? I've talked about it before. My dilemma is, should I be facing the altar <laughs> as a, as a, a, essentially as a prayer, or should I be facing you as a blessing? <laughs> Doing that. And maybe I need to get a little lazy Susan and just sort of spin around. I suppose that's probably not bad. Idea. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's the that's what's happening there. It's, it's God's name is put upon us again and again and again. And that, and that continues throughout this whole thing. To be in the name of the Lord is to be in the very presence of God. That is, we confess the real presence in the Lord's name. So that's kind of all what is uh, packed in to the Son of It's a lot there, isn't it? Pretty amazing. It's, uh, there's uh, there's so much to uh, to kind of sink and reflect on in that that it's uh, hard to even pretty even know where to get. Yeah, Don. I remember our squad of the community service. That was the anger of full. Our full.
don't see it with my, I may not see it with my eyes. In fact, um, the, this, is, this is why um, it's so remarkable the variety that we have in Christian churches, that you can have uh, a, an incredibly simple, uh, simple place, or even you know, a, a think of the uh, think of the early Christians worshiping in the catacombs under Rome. You know, how's that for a lovely place to remind you of eternal life? Go into a go into a dingy uh, the dingy cave where dead people are buried. Jesus is risen. <laughs> um, but we go from that to a cathedral <laughs> and kind of everything in between. And whether we're talking about um, whether we're talking about the, the one or the other, God is presence by His Word, not by the splendor of the space. Yeah, very interesting. Any other Ben? I know you can't quite answer these questions. But you're going to ask me anyway, <laughs> aren't you? How is this lost on most of the questions? Well, that's, I, yeah, I mean, that's my, kind of my, uh, my short version on that, is that because Western Protestantism does not confess the real presence of Christ in the supper, all of this liturgy stuff ultimately does not make any sense. Because if this is just symbolic, or if it's just Jesus is in my heart, and, and what else is going on doesn't matter, then all, none of this stuff matters either. And it, and it kind of, and I don't think that that's a, you know, that's sort of a snap thing. That's what's so interesting about how many Protestant churches are kind of rediscovering the liturgy. And what they're finding is that that's messing with their theology in the Lord's Supper. Are they coming to friends? I just don't know it yet. So, so yeah, that's, that's the challenge. I want to look at one, one part piece before we're done here. I know that, uh, and you can be like, thank you. We've looked at this a couple times before. Um, this is this uh, uh, Flemish altarpiece uh, called the Adoration of the Lamb. And I'll uh, zoom this zoom this in so you can kind of see see the altar itself, where you get uh, the lamb. And and I know it's, it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit dark, but you can. You can kind of see that there, the, there's a chalice here, and that the blood of the lamb is going into the chalice, and that this altar is surrounded by, by the angels. But as we saw, it's not only by the angels, it's actually all of heaven, and uh, all of heaven and earth. And, uh, and that here's a baptismal font that kind of enters the way in. And this is a... I would argue a confession of the real presence of God with his people, of Christ in the sacrament, and all of this stuff kind of attacked in here together. Alright. On that note, we are ready to vote. Next week we will look at the uh, prayers surrounding the uh, the words of institution, and if we're, uh, I don't know, we might get to the Lord's Prayer. We'll see. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, with you all. Amen. Have a great week,